Well, we wrap up this Wednesday morning series and refresh online with another message from Ken Jenkins. He's in the book of Jeremiah today on how much fight do you have left? This is an important message for us to end these morning sessions with because the reality is people are just quitting. They're quitting life, they're discouraged, they're depressed, they don't feel like there's any purpose, they don't know if they're ever going to get their lives or normality back. But you have to press through in moments like this. Some of the things we worry about are first world problems that the third world is not even thinking about because they live with pressure every day. Do you have the capacity and the tenacity to push through and to press on? Well, Ken's gonna challenge us with that with some remarkable illustrations. So I hope that you'll stay with us, invite somebody to watch with you. Every year when I come here, um, you'll notice there's no computer, but usually there is. Uh, I do uh, messages in uh, gymnasiums, on ball fields, in uh, barn lofts for Cowboy Church. Uh, never a glitch, never a breakdown, <laughs> never a problem, never a, never a missed opportunity. It just seems to, to click. But today, my message deals with the battle we're in. So the battle started early. And let me tell you, it's a sign that we're on the front line at Sherwood. Amen. The front line of the battle. And my message today deals with how much fight do you and I have left. It's not my intent to, uh, to come through as... Um, Dr. Thunderbolt, as Vance Havner used to say. But I'm greatly concerned with where we are as a nation, where we are as a church, and where we are as individuals. It's been a tremendous burden on me for years, but it has really come to a peak in my life to where it's, uh, uh, it, it's always uh, just a daily concern of the times we live in. And, uh, and I know that's your concern as well. Uh, the church has never been in a neutral position. Uh, followers of Christ have never been in a position where we could walk comfortably and not be aware and alert to the battle that rages around us. Uh, our very theme for this meeting is not a complacent theme or meant to sound good. To, to awake my soul is to me is a prayer and a plea to God. Uh, when our soul uh, is awakened, we know that uh, we have a keen sensitivity and an openness to the Holy Spirit, we cry out. And when we cry out, we're brought to a greater awareness of who we are in Christ and who Christ is in our life and what we're called to be as, as men and women. Our fervent prayer to God, Lord, awaken us, can result in a powerful and yet a very personal move of God in each of our lives. Awakening is a our prayer, it's our heart's desire. So I come to say that and that I'm very concerned that it may be not only past time for us to wake up, but it could be the last time. It's time for us to wake fully to God. Uh, most of my years on this earth, uh, God's allowed me to see Him and the things that He made. As Romans 1.20 says to recognize His invisible attributes and hidden characteristics through the things that He's made. It comes with um, great excitement and joy at times, but it always comes with, with deep conviction that I see illustrations of, of God and, and His creation. The, the title that you see was, was chosen after much, uh, much time in prayer, much uh, time in God's Word. Uh, I'll explain uh, later why I was prompted to use cats uh, for our conversation. I have a reason for looking that direction as you'll see shortly, uh, but uh, not everyone likes cats, <clears throat> but uh, I'll explain that just a little bit later. But let me tell you a little about the photograph you're seeing. 
This photograph was taken several years ago when I was walking up a rocky ridge with a friend out in Montana. His dog was on a leash and all of a sudden the dog began to growl and, and pull frantically at that leash so the fellow held him back and kept him quiet. We could hear in the distance that there was a deep growl that echoed down through the rocks. You could multiply the purr of a cat by about 500 times and add a little bit of unpleasant discontent, and you can better imagine the sound we heard. I scanned the ridge with my binoculars, and I finally saw that mountain lion laying in the boulders. My friend was getting very anxious. He was taking care of the dog, but he was concerned where the cat was, and he started saying things like, how big is he? And then he said, does he look mad? <clears throat> And I was looking through the binoculars, and I remember saying this to him. I said, you know, I really can't tell. And by looking at him, I really can't tell if it's a yawn or a yowl. Remember that. Let me try to stop and make a point. Our, our title is, How Much Fight Do You Have Left? We know we fight our battles on our knees. We also know that as a result of the empowering and enabling of, of God, we walk sensitively and, and boldly, not because we can overcome, but because Jesus has overcome. We encounter the enemy and confront our battles after we put on the whole armor of God. But the fact is we're constantly in a battle. Quite often we talk with fellow believers about how shaken we are, the, the condition of the world and what we hear on the, on the nightly news or daily news. We rant and and rave about what we see wrong in the world and, and where we want the church to be in the midst of all this mess, as we call it at times. We, we seem to have solid answers for what the country needs to do to get back in a right relationship with God. We seem to have solutions for most everything. We use strong words, and we have the posture of a lion at times. If you listen closely, you'd think we've ever, we have everything figured out if the world would just do what we suggest. And we do have many answers if we're standing on the Word of God, but truly, the only plan is God's plan, and He gives us our part one step at a time. The only course of action is to obey Him, to trust Him, to follow His lead, to leave the results to God's divine plan. And a huge part of obedience is responding to God's commands. And those include, number one, waking up, number two, always looking up, number three, standing up for the truth, no matter the cost, and number four, facing up to the challenges that constantly confront us. But you know, much of our conversation reveals that we've reversed the order. We try to face up to challenges before we wake up to God's leading. We stand up for the truth, hoping the cost is minimal before we look up for wisdom. To match the illustration of this cat as the world looks on and listens, they can't tell if it's a yawn or a yell. I want to take an, an illustration out of God's Word. I was, uh, I'm just going to be honest with you so you don't think I've, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've lost it or become an umpire at a baseball game. I'm, I'm going to be raising my hand a lot and, uh, and, and, and if, I get, if I'm praising the Lord, don't change the slide too quick, but it's really just to signal them to change the slide because that's exactly what we're going to be doing. I was supposed to have a clicker. I forgot that too. It's floating here somewhere. God will have His way, and this will be a great day. But I want you to turn with me in Jeremiah 46. And you say, well, that's an unusual place to go. But, but I just I want to look at this text and and I want to look at it as one of the many times in Scripture where God's people try to fill their own needs without following God's lead, and God interrupts, God intervenes to stop His people. And there's some great parallels here, I believe. So turn with me in the 46th chapter of Jeremiah. Let's read some verses that we may or may not be familiar with, and draw some lessons from this if we could. So in verse 27, 
But as for you, O Jacob, my servant, do not fear, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For see, I am going to save you from afar, and your descendants from the land of their captivity. And Jacob will return and be undisturbed and secure, with no one making him tremble. O Jacob, my servant, do not fear, declares the Lord, for I am with you. For I will make a full end of all the nations where I have driven you. And this is important. Yet I will not make a full end of you, and I will correct you properly, and by no means leave you unpunished. Father in heaven, this is, this is your word. And, and Lord, I was led to this word. And, and, and Father, it's all important from the first syllable to the last we read. And, and God, I just pray that you'll make it clear how this applies to what we're we're saying today, Lord, and as we look at these images, God, it's what you made and it's what you said, so use it for your glory, Lord, and put your words in my mouth, and we'll thank you, Lord, for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I want to build some groundwork as, as always. I believe there are many parallels to the modern church here. Battle lines have been drawn. Here we see the Jewish remnant after the fall of Jerusalem. We see men and women, quite like men and women today, trying to fix things, depend on many sources without seeking the Lord or, or listening to God's Word. There's a continuing sinful behavior, though God has intervened harshly, people are still bent on having their own way. The armies of Egypt have lined up along the Euphrates River. And Jeremiah and his God-given ability knows what this means. God's about to move in a mighty way. It, it would seem in our day that God is about to move in a mighty way based on what we see and, and how God's moved before. But it's all in God's time and according to His plan. It must have broken Jeremiah's heart to see God's people following after deceitful and hypocritical rulers, even, even ones professing to be loyal followers followed after men. They preferred the showy leader who seemed to have all the answers over the Word of God spoken by a humble prophet. You know, whether then or now, we can never expect God's blessing to come from godless men. And in spite of man's decisions, God's divine plan will stand no matter how the headlines read. In the text we read, God promises that He'll take out the threats to the lives of His people and He'll save those who cry out to Him after He sends them through a fire that will correct them. No matter how dark it appears, we always have God's promise. The people looked around and they found great reason to, to fear. First of all, there was trouble in their face right before them. There was, there was trouble and threats. Second reason they had to fear was that there was an anticipation of being punished because they sinned yet more. After all their bad choices, they chose what and who they would follow. And then one day they looked around and those influences and those people they had followed and sought relief from and sought pleasure from and deserted them. The Bible says, all thy lovers have forsaken thee. That always happens when we listen to the wrong voice. God allows a, a wandering soul in many cases to face dark trouble alone. Sin leads to silence and desertion, and then a fear sets in. Yet there's a distinct difference when God's people face the fire of correction as opposed to how the enemy faces the fire. We know that fire destroys uh, burnable, if we could use that word, combustible materials uh, that pass through the fire. Destructible things show their true nature when they pass through the fire and they're consumed. But that same fire attacks the indestructible, and the thing that, ha thing that happens is it, it separates and burns away things that are attached to the indestructible. It burns away the growths that have attached themselves to the indestructible. 
the leeches that cling to the indestructible, the adhesions, the fire consumes those things that are destructible. And God intends for us to be able to say, I, I will not be destroyed in the furnace of my trials, and I won't go to pieces like others do, yet I must remain in this fire as long as God requires me to do so, so that I'll submit to God's wise instruction and to His firm commands. In, in these verses, Babylon represents the proud city of God, and, and Jerusalem represents the holy city of God. God used Babylon to chastise His people, but Babylon is wicked and evil, and they went too far. And it reinforces in our heart that any nation that curses the Jews will ultimately be cursed by God. Because God says in Genesis 12, I'll bless those who will bless you, and those who curse you I will curse. And God was saying, announce and proclaim and raise a signal. God's about to set His people apart one more time and in a very significant way. When we read further along into chapter 50, we, we see a verse that, that sets the tone for, the, for our text, and it's, it's chapter 50 and in verse 14, and, and Scripture reads, draw your battle lines against Babylon on every side. All you who bend the bow, shoot at her, do not be sparing with your arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Draw up your battle lines on every side against Babylon. The King James says, put yourselves in array against Babylon round about. In both cases, I believe this could be interpreted to say getting, get in a fighting posture. In God's Word, the word fight is found more than a hundred times. In the Hebrew, it's laham. In Greek, prorizo, but it says to his people, in both cases, put your life in a fighting posture. It means to come forth and, and stand up, to suffer before and suffer for souls in Jesus' name, to fight for those souls. It means to fight against evil. It means should you have retreated or think you have fought your share, return to the fight if you're not in it. We could meet this morning and as if this is just one more gathering, as though we're fulfilling our, our duty to come together and ask God to encourage us. But I can tell you something, there are other meetings being held. As we greet and meetings, as we greet and meet, there are meetings around the country, if not around the world, that are designed to undermine and suppress the Word of God and the principles that you and I stand for. They're in a fighting position to destroy the spread of the gospel, though it's a losing effort. However, when we look around and we go back to our original illustration, it's become very difficult to tell where the church is yawning or yelling. Because fight means to prevail against. It means to overcome and to wage war against sin in our own lives and, and around the world. We want to finish well. We want to fight the good fight. And that requires being desperate for a move of God in, in our own life. A desperate cry begins to awaken us to the battle, the battle we're in. It's, it always begins in me and it begins in you. I'm getting used to this now. I don't do too. Huh? <laughs> I, I ask myself this because uh, every message we've heard deals with this in a sense. Could it be that when God calls us to bow down, we don't stay down long enough to get up in the power of God and to fight that good fight that we're called to fight? Today the, the church continues to embrace easy words. And sometimes those easy words just justify our complacency. We, we say things like we're striving for, we're seeking it's our desire to see God move. And yet we lack staying on our face until God breaks our heart and we're right with Him. And then getting up and rolling up our sleeves and getting back in the battle that we're called to fight. We need to go daily to the living water, humble ourselves and cry out to God for forgiveness for our lack of watchfulness. 
The enemy is taking more and more ground. Souls are perishing all around us. My mind often goes back to those life-saving stations in New England, specifically out on the coast of Cape Cod. The words of that station keeper are burned in my heart. I commented that they're they appeared to be so ready. Everything was so well equipped and well maintained. It seems like they're just ready to go out in a minute's notice and save the perishing. And I'll never forget that station keeper's words as he quickly and pleasantly replied, yes, uh, we have everything that could ever be needed. Those boats are seaworthy and poised to react. He said, now the only thing is, we're just not in the life-saving business anymore. Not in the life-saving business. What, what business is there left when the world's dying without Jesus and we're comfortable in our pulpits and our pews to maintain the status quo? I, I believe status quo is just a temporary position that's poised for decline. When, when I was a kid, we used to invent our own games and toys, but we did have some roller skates and we'd take a piece of plywood and put it up on a saw horse and, and, and another one flat out from that on another saw horse and and the object of the game was just, you know, to get up some steam and, and get up that incline of plywood. And if you made it to the top, you know, it was just smooth sailing. But can you imagine what happens when you hesitate in the midst of that climb, wearing roller skates on a steep incline trying to get to the top? That's maintaining the status quo. What business is there when God tells us to take up the battle? And yet men and women are drowning in worldliness and, and bombarded with, with false doctrine. We have stacks of life preservers, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we can't pick one up and toss it in reach of a man or a woman or child. We stand in the powerhouse of God with unshakable word of God in our, in our hand whether a pastor, a teacher, or a lay person, yet often we, we tread lightly and pick out and choose the things that tickle the ear instead of penetrate the heart. And we stand accountable for our lack of watchfulness. Vance Havner told of the church so well built you couldn't hear a sound from the outside. And that convicts our heart. And I think of the church so self-insulated that we can't hear the cries of the dying world from the inside. There's a battle raging. The hoofbeats are drawing near. Our time is fleeting. It, it's not me or you, but it's Jesus in us, and we must do all we are called to do in His strength. So let me, that's a cat, Tom, Bill. That'd be a cat. I just want to tell you that why I chose, or part of the reason I chose the cat to illustrate several points today. I've had all kinds of creatures growing up. I'm still growing up. Recently, constantly, my wife would tell you, people just bring me things. I've had some respectable raccoons, some impossible possums, some frisky foxes and multiplying rabbits. And through the years, I've had some great dogs, and I've had one super little cat. Now, I know guys tell me, even recently, I'm sorry, but I hate cats. You don't need to apologize to me. I don't even know exactly what that means. That statement might get you an audition with the village people singing Macho Man, but I'm telling you. <laughs> Unless you've spent some time around an old faithful cat, you've missed something. God taught me a lot watching that little cat on the left there. I called him Earl because he came about weighing a few ounces through the slats of my wooden fence one morning when I walked out on a frosty, frosty cold morning and I didn't think he'd make it and I tried to find him a home and you know the story, they've already found a home. The cat on the right's a wild mountain lion, and the one on the left was my 14-year-old cat, Earl. 
God taught me a lot watching Earl. Through the years, his favorite place was on my lap. Early every morning, it didn't matter if I placed a, the Bible or a concordance on top of Earl. He just wanted to be in his favorite place. A couple of months ago, it became apparent to my wife and I that, that Earl was sick. It turned out to be cancer, and two weeks ago, I stood in that room that I've dreaded being in many times before, and I watched as they put Earl to sleep. Now, that, of course, this is no plea for, for sympathy. Many of you have been there with your pet. But I lingered over my little buddy there with a lump in my throat trying to be brave and, and yet show my gratitude to the vet. And the vet leaned forward and said something to me that became very encouraging. My vet's a godly man and a good friend, and he knows I spend a lot of time with animals. And, and the first thing he said was, you know, Ken, a man isn't worth his salt if he gets used to this. He said, it hurts me, it hurts for you, and it hurts me for, for your, your cat. He said, when it stops hurting, he said, I'll just do something else. But he said, I, I want to share some information with you, and you'll appreciate this maybe more than others would. He said, you've watched and likely photographed a lot of different kinds of cats, lynx, bobcat, mountain lions. He said, you know, the case with Earl here is similar to all wild cats. He said, it would seem that when they get sick, they go down very fast and then they're gone. He said, can I tell you something? He said, that's not at all the case. He said, a cat of any kind will do everything in his power to disguise any hurt or illness. He said, they become prey when they lay down or lay around. He said, it's a sign of weakness not to carry on and, and to hold their head up, so to speak. He said, they'll keep fighting and they'll keep going until they reach a point where they seem that they know that they can't go anymore. They fight until they can't. He said, by the time we see the signs of weakness or the signs that they're sick, it's usually at the end of their life. And then he said, if it's any consolation, your old buddy fought the good fight and you can be proud you're just allowed to watch it. So I shook his hand and took Earl home and I thought about everything he said. I thought about how too many times I used convenience or inconvenience, I should say, and, and I used circumstances as excuses for not responding what God, to what God's told me to do. I pulled over on the way home on the back road there, and I just asked God to forgive me. I said, Lord, I, I know this sounds silly, and, but not really. You know my heart. I said, I, I want to be like Earl in the sense of never letting down, never letting up. Lord, I know there's predators circling my witness every day. And I have your strength within me and your word is my guide. So, Lord, I want to hold my head up for you. And Lord, I thank you for a simple lesson at a time like this. So I, I got home and, and I walked into my study and I'd been struggling with what to use to illustrate this message of being in a battle, and therein lies the use of the cat. <laughs> a dear saint said in the 19th century, early 19th century, he said, we procure, and we know what that means. It means that the results that we obtain are due to our personal efforts. It means that we're, we bring about circumstances or consequences because of our own choices and lifestyle. But he said, we procure our miserable captivities through sin and unwatchfulness. God allows us, even a nation, to sense an isolation from his presence so that we taste the bitterness of our evils. In that isolation, we begin to understand where our personal sin takes us, and it always takes us further than we intended to go. God, His graciousness and long-suffering intervenes. God sees our affliction, but He hears the pitiful cry of His people, and He puts a halt to our direction. And we see that from this example in Jeremiah to many, many places in God's Word. That, to me, it's a, that's a very encouraging word based on God's Word and the way that He deals with His people. Uh, it, it's a word we should spread. 
tens of thousands of men and women are, are, have wandered out of church, out of God's will. I talk to people every week, and they, they tell me they can't take that first step to come back. They just, they're ashamed they walked away from God, and they feel they've been away too far. You know, excuses never make sense. But you just want to grab that person and, and, and give them a hug and say, friend, don't, don't you see, if you belong to Jesus, that lonely, miserable condition that you're in is a sign that God's let you find the end of yourself. You not see that God is now waiting with open arms to welcome you back home. God loved you enough to let you feel the loneliness and the isolation. He loves you. Come home. We can't find assurance in ourselves, and, and we don't find assurance in our circumstances, but the moment that we can feel that we're in God's hands and, and that God has a plan and a future for our lives, that assurance becomes not only very possible but very real. Folks are starving to hear that Jesus wants to forgive them and restore them and build their lives into a usable condition, but the church yawns and says, I'm comfortable with the crowd that I have. Those people made their decisions and God will deal with them. Well, yes, thank God He'll deal with them because He loves them, but He'll deal with you and I for our lack of watchfulness. You know, I stop a lot and think about why we're in the condition we're in today, not only in our country, but in our neighborhoods. Isn't it true that Every man and woman we refuse to share Christ with has the potential to be the one who winds up on the six o'clock news. Isn't it true that that one that God said speak to, share with, witness to could be the next one promoting a destructive view, even becoming an enemy of the church? Unwatchfulness results in being surrounded by the enemy while we sleep. Last week, I a friend of mine, and we go all the way back to kindergarten. But um, this fella grew up in church, had a wonderful Christian family. His dad owned a corner drugstore. It was a place where everybody met after school. But Reese wandered for many years. And during his time of not paying attention, his daughter became involved in drugs and died last month from an overdose. Her death has devastated him and, and he came running to Jesus in a most powerful way. Bill reminded me last night, he's one of these I'm all in. Broke his heart. He's, he's what you might call a homegrown fella. Big, big guy. He was a great football player and earned his degree from University of Tennessee, but his choice was to farm and to raise mules, and he's good at it. He knows all the mountain people up ever holler, as we say, around the mountains there. Sometimes he calls me half a dozen times a day, but, but I love Reese because he wants so much to be close to Jesus every day of his life. I agree with an old preacher friend of mine that said, give me a feller with a heart for Jesus, though he may still be a little rough around the edges and yet he's headed in the right way. Give me that fellow over the one who thinks he's arrived and is usually unteachable. But let me go back to the, the phone call. Reese is my friend's name and he, he mentioned this elderly man that I know that lives way back on the mountain. And he mentioned how he'd been praying for him for weeks and he wanted to go wanted me to go with him and and share the gospel but he was so upset he was he was crying and shaking he was telling me he said I said listen we'll, we'll go we'll, we'll, let's pray and, and we'll go I promise don't don't be upset we'll go he said you don't understand that's not it he said I have really messed up and I said well let's let's just pray let's talk to God about it he said well first I've got to tell you what I did I said well now and before I could finish he started telling me anyway. He said, you know, I was leaving church Sunday night, and I, and I had this, this dear friend of ours on, on my heart, heavy on my heart. He said, I, I was looking for someone to, to pray with me, and, and all of a sudden I saw our, our head deacon. And he said, you know, I figured he's a wise man, and, 
because he, he's our city attorney as well. And he said, I pulled him aside and, and, and I asked him, I said, do you know such and such, this older fellow that I love that lives up on the mountain? He said, well, sure. I, I think uh, I did some land deeds for him many years ago. And so Reese said, well, I'm worried about him. And he said, and, and it's more than that. He said, it's just, it's killing me. So the deacon stopped and put his hand on Reese's shoulder. He said, well, really? He said, what's wrong with him? And, and Reese just tears flowing down his face said, he's lost. And, and he didn't know the Lord. And the deacon dropped his hand from his shoulder and stepped back. He said, Reese, he said, my goodness. He said, I thought he was bad sick. I told Reese, I said, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, that's not the response that, that a godly man would share, and, and he must have been distracted. But I said, let's just keep praying. I said, I'll go with you, and we'll go see this man. And he said, no, I, I hadn't told you what I did. He, he said, that hit me so hard that he wasn't burdened for, for this man. And he said, I grabbed that deacon, and I got right in his face. And he said, I was holding on to him, and I said, so if this man had pneumonia, you'd be terribly concerned, but the fact that he's lost and he's dying and he's going to hell doesn't seem to bother you at all. Is that right? Reese said, you know, the guy didn't say a word, but I could tell he was really upset. He said, so I just let him go. And I left. He said, what do I do now? I wanted to say, if you'll come over here, I'll give you a big hug and fix some dinner for you, but... We talked about it and prayed, and we went to see that mountain fella, and he's receptive, and, and God's dealing with him, and, and we'll keep going. But let me tell you the results of a fruitless religion. Scripture says, we lay up for ourselves a heap of destruction by not practicing the truth we hear and not laying it to heart. If we study how it is that we step away from God, we see that it's by looking at one truth after the next and disregarding its importance and its instruction. Sad to confess, the church has been and is doing this today. Essential things have become smaller things that we dabble in, considered by many as suggestions rather than commands. They're viewed as small things rather than the keys to a right relationship with God. The Bible calls that practice using trifles. We know what a trifle is. It's a, it's a thing considered of little value and little importance. To trifle is to, to flirt with, to tinker with. And the church is being led into that miserable ca captivity that that old saint talked about by seeing God's Word as something that can be bent and interpreted to suit man's desire for a comfortable message. We can only seek God's truth as the treasure it is and never as an everyday teaching without power. As we uh, find ourselves along the New England coast again in any small fishing village at this time of the year, uh, docks would be clear and empty, not like you see, because this is prime lobster season. Uh, they're, they're fishing especially for those mature, big, hard shell lobster. But as the water gets colder and the lobster move further out and become more difficult to catch, uh, it, it's harder to trap them, and, and few people make the attempts. The weather's bad, and when that happens, the scene becomes more like the dock that you see here. We'd see countless arrangements on that dock and, of rope and markers and traps. Everything's in its place. Everything's arranged so that there's no confusion when those boats are loaded again to, to, and ready to go out. There's an art to storing the necessities. It's more like a, a cycle where all that's not being currently used is clearly laid so that when it is used, there's no entanglement or confusion. When we consider the many things that the Holy Spirit's revealed to us, the mo we know those truths can't be altered and they can't be compromised. They're firm and unshakable and forever burned in our hearts so that God can remind us and, and use those truths not only to guide us and mold us, but to correct us when we're off course. There can be no careless use of those truths lest we will find entanglements and, and confusion that affect our life as well as the lives around us. When John wrote to the seven churches, 
It wasn't that there was just seven churches. Seven's a perfect number, and the churches represent churches everywhere throughout the world. John writes to you and to me today, and, and we find ourselves in these writings. Each, each letter is a distinct letter with an operative word and a challenging phrase, and it sums up the whole letter, it seems. We can draw the battle lines and get back in the fight for souls if we hear what the Spirit says. To the church at Ephesus, the Spirit says, repent. You left your first love. Remember and repent. So as we close, let, let's look closely at the church and it's what we're called to be. So let's ask ourselves, who are we, church? We're the church of the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God was made flesh, not standing distant or unapproachable in some Superior holy stance, because he is, though he is superior and he is holy, but he came to us because he loved us and he came to the midst of our, our misery and our sinfulness. Every outcast has found comfort in, in the Word and the Word is Jesus and he calls the harlot his friend. That Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Jesus is the head of the church. Is that the church we imitate? Or is it the church found moving in circles of self-imposed righteousness, making it difficult for lost and, and, and hurting people to make their way to Jesus through our familiar cliques and our adopted attitudes of choosing who we'll receive? Have we used the crutch of busyness to avoid giving ourselves away to Jesus? The Spirit says, remember and repent. Who are we, church? We're the church of the cross. That's not the cross of stained glass decoration or silver and gold jewelry. It's not the cross that's referred to during convenient times of the year for some sentimental reasons. We're the church of the cross of Jesus Christ, and that means total denial. We're the complete opposite of the world scale of values where self is blotted out and Jesus is everything. Is that the church we imitate? Are we easily affected by secular values and ideas of what constitutes prosperity and, and success and security does the world influence what we claim is important. Who are we, church? We're the church of the resurrection. We have the greatest, gladdest, best news that's ever shattered the ears of man. That news that takes the darkest night and turns it into the brightest day. We're the church that at one time went singing through the streets and and around the world, despite fires of the martyrs, the good news was shouted and proclaimed, He's rise, he, he is risen, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Is that the church we are? Or did we just shrink a little at the suggestions that we bear our souls for Christ who gave His all for me and, and for you? We take hold of our faith so carefully composed that we rarely Yawn, much less yell, as the church becomes submerged in tedious routines. And the Spirit says, remember and repent. Who are we, church? Oh, yes, we're the church of Pentecost, where men heard the mighty rushing wind and saw the fire fall, where they spoke a language that was clear as the wonderful power of Almighty God. The church of Pentecost, where all men were united in one accord and in, in one place, and they were welded and molded into such a fellowship that the, the world had never seen anything like it. A witness like that shakes the world, draws them to be a part of what Jesus is doing. Is that who we are? Do we walk unconcerned, uninterested in asking forgiveness or seeking rec reconciliation with our brother and sister? How can we go day by day, knowing that the Lord has called us to practice and speak reconciliation to the broken lives of folks without Jesus when we can't call them home to a hospital for sinners where everyone's together for the sake of growing closer to Jesus. We'll always have problems and issues that must be dealt with scripturally, but we have great doctrines in common that preserve precious truth. We hold to beliefs that are miraculous, they're world-shattering. They're so incredible, they, they dwarf anything that could keep us apart. There being no mistake when the church yells for the truth of the gospel. 
And the church finds itself like this cat between two mountains. One place is the place we were, and the place ahead is the place God's calling us to, and it always takes the leap of faith. The word for shout in the Greek is ruah, or best put into practice, ruah. It means to split the ears with sound, to cry out loudly, to sound the alarm. Many places in the word shout is utilized before people rush onto the battlefield. Ruah was the cry that signaled the enemy was about to be engaged. So let me ask you the searching question, how much fight do we have left? Whittier wrote a, a poem, and in that poem, the one line says, blow winds of God, awake and blow the mists of earth away. Shine, O light divine, and show how far and how wide we stray. Is it not time we came together, that we took a stand? Is it not time we embrace who we are as Christ and fall in love with Jesus so much that no matter the cost, we're willing to stay in the battle? Isn't it time we acknowledge that God created us in His image. He placed us where we are and teaches us what we need to know. Each of us would be unique and, and we're different in many ways, but we recognize our differences and even in denominations in geographic location and in race, it's not God's plan for us to be separate, but to be together, to reflect Christ every day, wherever we are, because of who we are. So the world sees him in our lives welded together in that fellowship that stuns the world. It's worth standing for. It's worth fighting for. It's worth dying for. Vance Abner says if it's worth anything, it's worth everything, and it is worth everything. So why should we yawn when our mouths should be wide open in prayer and praise, proclaiming and shouting the good news that the world yearns to hear, no matter how the headlines read? How much fight do we have left? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, Lord, you've dealt with my heart in so many ways. As you have in the last weeks of preparing this, Lord, I, I pray it was clear, Lord. At least I pray, God, that you took the things that you wanted each person to hear and in your miraculous way, you you develop those in a unique message to touch the heart with just what we needed at this time. There's so much here, God, but ultimately it comes down to this. How much do we love you, Lord? How much have we died to ourself? Where's our commitment, Lord? Where's our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit? How alert are we to the battle that rages around us? How much do we love the lost? How willing are we to live for you, Lord, as a witness? Father, you're asking so many questions in our hearts, and you know the answers. Show us the truth in our own heart. In Jesus' name, amen.